Hello! Welcome back to the wonderful world of IB Biology. In last year's edition, you learned about ecology, and you learned about evolution. You also learned about the human body and human physiology. Last, but certainly not least, you learned about neurobiology. But really, neural development, the brain, and the perceptions. We will start this lecture with a quick quiz about the parts of the eye. Name all the parts of the eye in alphabetical order. Extra credit if you can do it while standing on your head. Nah, just kidding, but seriously. Last year we pretty much covered only the large-scale biology, the macrobiology. In this year's edition, we dive more into the microbiology, where you will be learning about cell biology, molecular biology, and genetics. When you think micro, you think small. So that's it. We're learning about small-scale biology, starting off with cell biology. You probably discussed and covered a number of these topics before in your previous years of school. But nevertheless, IB Biology is a special beast. Not only are we going to learn some fascinating things this year, but it is always important to make connections with previous material from last year. Remember how we talked about how bacteria exhibit evolution? Well, bacteria are living cellular organisms. In topic 1.1, we get the introduction to cells. Cell theory, what it means to be living, and stem cells. So let's cut to the chase. All the pictures are examples of living organisms, and all of them are or have cells. The essential idea in 1.1 is the evolution of multicellular organisms allowed cell specialization and cell replacement. See? There you go, a connection to topic five and evolution. Onwards we go. All organisms contain one or more cells which are capable of carrying on the life activities needed by the organism. This idea is often referred to as the cell theory. The cell theory is a scientific theory which describes the properties of cells. These cells are the basic unit of structure in all organisms and also the basic unit of reproduction. One part of the cell theory is that all living organisms are composed of cells. Multicellular organisms, for example, humans, are composed of many cells, while unicellular organisms, for example, bacteria, are composed of only one cell. Cells are the basic unit of structure in all organisms. Boom! Step one. The second part of the cell theory is that cells are the smallest unit of life. They are the smallest structures capable of surviving on their own. Boom! The third part of the cell theory states that cells come from pre-existing cells and cannot be created from non-living material. For example, new cells arise from cell division and a zygote arises from the fusion of an egg cell and a sperm cell. Boom! You're probably like, that's great, Mr. O, but remember in science, we need evidence to support a theory. So where's the evidence? There's so much evidence for the cell theory. In fact, while there are a few oddities that we will get to in a minute, we humans have never observed the cell theory to not be true. Subcell components cannot perform the functions of life on their own. Since scientists first observed cells from the 17th century, all plants, animals, and fungi have contained one or more cells. Lastly, we've observed cells coming from other cells but not spontaneous generation of cells. This does, however, bring up the philosophical debate of how the first cell was ever created. The last important piece here is to reiterate what a scientific theory is versus the daily use of theory. In our daily use, the word theory might be used as a synonym for guess. But in science, a scientific theory is shown to be true throughout repeated observations and experiments. There is no current doubt, though this does not mean it should not be questioned or tested. As of yet, no evidence has been collected that does not support the idea of the cell theory. As I mentioned, there are three atypical types of cells and tissues that we know do not conform to a standard notion of what constitutes a cell. This slide explains precisely three examples that you need to know and be able to relate them back to the cell theory. They are the striated muscle fibers, aseptate fungal hypha, and the giant algae. I won't read these word for word. I think that you're more than a capable audience. Additionally, there are three other oddballs that are worth mentioning. Red blood cells have no nucleus. Mitochondria reproduce inside living cells. And viruses, which are debated as living or non-living, do not reproduce and require a host. What is life? What does it mean to be living? Am I really alive? Or am I just breathing, bleeding robot sent here from another time? You may have once asked yourself these very questions. Remember that one of the components of the cell theory is that all organisms are composed of cells. That really means one or more cells. So in order to be living, the cell or cells need to be able to carry out the functions of life. So tackling the question of, what does it mean to be living? Well, scientists have established criteria for what this means. You can see these here. One thing is that to be living, you must have a metabolism, which means that living things undertake essential chemical reactions. Another thing is reproduction. To be living, 
an organism can produce offspring, either sexually or asexually. Another component is sensitivity. Really, this is being responsive to stimulus around you. If someone dumped a bucket of ice water on you, you probably would have a reaction. Another characteristic of all living things is homeostasis. Living things maintain a stable internal environment. We learned a lot about this last year in topic six during human physiology. Another one is excretion. Living things exhibit the removal of waste products. Maybe you have heard of best-selling kids book, Everybody Poops. Well, everybody and everything that is considered living poops. Sixth in these characteristics is nutrition. Living things exchange materials and gases with the environment. Once again, the tie to topic six in human physiology that we have seen in the past is here. Last but not least is growth. Living things can move and change size or shape. While I know some organisms that do not move a lot, they still move and change size. Plants, for example, do a lot of growing. You should know these by heart, memorize them, talk about them at dinner, and talk about them on the basketball court too. There are two specific examples that you need to be aware of and know with regards to applications of the characteristics of living organisms. One organism is the paramecium, which is a heterotroph, and the second is Cenodesmus, which is an autotroph. You should already know that an autotroph is an organism that makes its own energy and nutrition, and heterotrophs ingest other organisms to gain their energy. I will talk through these as examples while you read along in the slide. Look at the cute paramecium in the picture to the right. Such a wonderful life this organism has, going around in aquatic environments, looking like the outline of a shoe. I mean, it's unicellular, so it's single and ready to mingle. Paramecia are surrounded by hairs called cilia, which allow it to move. This is the responsiveness. Paramecia engulf food via a specialized membranous feeding groove called a cytostome. Food particles are enclosed within small vacuoles that contain enzymes for digestion. So this is the metabolism. Solid wastes are removed via an anal pore, while liquid wastes are pumped out via contractile vacuoles. Essential gases enter and exit the cell via diffusion. Paramecia divide asexually, although horizontal gene transfer can occur via conjugation, which is a method of reproduction. It sounds pretty cool if you ask me. For the Cenodesmus, they exchange gases and other materials via diffusion. They have chlorophyll pigments, which allow organic molecules to be produced via photosynthesis. Daughter cells form as non-modal autospores via the internal asexual division of a parent cell. And Cenodesmus may exist as unicells, so one cell, or form colonies for protection. So I mentioned to you at the beginning that cells are really microbiology. Scientists have tools to study small organisms. The typical tool is the microscope. You can see that you definitely have some skills that you need to work on and practice related to the microscope. You definitely should know the parts of a light microscope and how these parts function. You should be able to calculate the magnification of whatever image you are looking at and be able to draw the depictions of what you're looking at. You also need to be able to use and make slides to look at. These skills are not overly complex or hard, but they do require practice. The magnification calculating is probably the trickiest, but with some dedication and practice, you too can become a master of the microscope. You will definitely be practicing this skill over the coming time. For all living things, both unicellular and multicellular, they all have cells. These cells have to exchange gas and food molecules into the cell and waste products out of the cell. So if you can imagine a large cell, it will be tricky to get everything to the middle of that cell. If you recall from geometry, the surface area is the total of all the faces that make up a 3D object. The volume is the amount of space that the object takes up. A cell's surface area is determined by its cell membrane which is the outer membrane of the cell. The cell membrane's job is to regulate the transport of materials into and out of the cell. As I mentioned, oxygen gas and nutrient molecules must be absorbed and waste products must be eliminated through the cell membrane. The internal regions of the cell are what constitutes the cell's volume. Inside the cell is where all the metabolic reactions occur, and these reactions require the gases and chemical nutrients. This is super important, and the rate of the metabolism of a cell is a function of its mass to volume ratio. Imagine for a minute that you blow up a balloon. As you blow it up, both the surface area and the volume increases, but the volume increases faster than the surface area. So the amount of surface area relative to the volume decreases. If this balloon was a paramecium cell, it would be more challenging for your paramecium cell to exchange materials to the middle of the cell and therefore survive. It's for this very reason that cells are often limited in their size. Think about it. Most cells you know are very small many microscopic. Typically, when a cell reaches a certain size, it has challenges sustaining itself 
and stimulate cell division through the process of mitosis or binary fission. By dividing, the size of the cell is reduced, and this keeps the cell within the optimal surface area to volume ratio. You'll be using cubes as models to demonstrate this exact concept with a dye to see how quickly the dye will diffuse. But as you know, cells can be pretty sneaky and they have adaptations that have enabled them to increase the surface area with respect to the volume. You can see two specific examples here, the villi in the small intestine and alveolar cells in the lungs. Both of these have bristle-like extensions called microvilli. Other adaptations include long extensions of the cell membrane in dendritic cells of the immune system, neuron cells, and epidermis cells in roots of plants. Some cells flatten themselves out to maximize the surface area. Red blood cells, pneumocytes in the lungs, and epithelial cells in capillaries are adapted in this way. As the name suggests, the main difference between multicellular and unicellular organisms is the number of cells that are present in them. Unicellular organisms are one single cell that functions on its own. An example would be a paramecium or a bacteria. Multicellular organisms contain one or more cell. An example of this would be Nelly the giraffe or humans. Multicellular organisms are capable of completing functions that unicellular organisms could not undertake. This is due to the collective actions of individual cells combining to create new synergistic effects. That's a fancy word. Emergence only occurs when the entity is observed to have properties its parts do not have on their own. These properties or behaviors emerge only when the parts interact in a wider whole. In the example here, each cell carries out functions of life. Working together, the cardiac tissues work to synchronize contractions amongst the cells and work together to pump blood. Additionally, the vessels of the cardiovascular system are able to pump blood throughout the body and the organism uses the blood to perform all of the interconnected functions needed to survive and reproduce. It's pretty mind-boggling if you put your brain cells together and think about it. There's a good link to TOK as emergence as a phenomenon is not unique to biology or the sciences. In multicellular organisms, a group of cells that specialize in the same way and perform the same function is a tissue. Tissues are able to form as cells specialized through differentiation. Differentiation is the process during development whereby newly formed cells become more specialized and distinct from one another as they mature. For example, brain cells, muscle cells, and lung cells have different structures and functions. This enables these cells to focus on fewer tasks and do the work more efficiently while saving energy. They can also have specialized structures and metabolism. As they do one or very few things all the time, they can evolve faster in that particular task. That's why multitasking is bad for you kids. So how does this differentiation happen? I mean, almost every cell has a nucleus and that nucleus has the same exact genetic codes. So you would think that every cell would be the same. Not so fast. Differentiation is due to the differences in gene expression in different cell types. Maybe one gene will be turned on for one cell, but for another cell it will be kept off. You will learn later that in gene expression, a sequence of DNA, which is called a gene, is transcribed and translated so a protein can be formed. Within the nucleus of a eukaryotic cell, DNA is packaged with proteins to form chromatin. Active genes are usually packaged in an expanded form called euchromatin that is accessible to transcriptional machinery. Inactive genes, the ones not being used, are typically packaged in a more condensed form called heterochromatin. It saves space and it's not transcribed. Differentiated cells will have different regions of DNA packaged as euchromatin and heterochromatin according to their specific function. Additionally, to make it even more complex, the external environment can regulate gene expression. For example, in some animals, there's a temperature sensitive gene that would control fur pigmentation, allowing it to be adapted for warmer or cooler climates. You probably have heard of stem cells before. So what are they? Well, a stem cell is an undifferentiated cell that can do two things. They can divide indefinitely to create more stem cells, which is known as self-renewal, or they can differentiate to become a specialized cell type in a multicellular organism, which is called potency. Remember the terms zygote and embryo. A zygote is a cell that results from a sperm fertilizing an egg. These cells of a zygote can differentiate into any body cell or even the placenta. Because they can do this, they are called totipotent stem cells. You know, like totally potent. The embryo is a short time later in development and consists of a blastocyst outer layer and an inner cell mass. The inner cell mass are called embryonic stem cells. They are capable of differentiating into any body cell. So they are called pluripotent. I mean, really, they can grow up and be pretty much whatever they want to be. Both totipotent 
and pluripotent stem cells are the most prevalent in the early embryonic development. This is because they have differentiated the least, and more cell divisions are necessary in order to begin growing and specializing. Think back to health class and seeing the video clips of human development in utero. There are other types of stem cells as well. Multipotent stem cells are found in the gastrula and also known as adult stem cells and can differentiate into number of closely related cell types. Unipotent stem cells are cells capable of self-renewal but do not differentiate like blood cells or nerve cells. Stem cells are hot, hot, hot topics in biology and medical research. Why? Well, we know that stem cells can divide repeatedly so they're not differentiated. So they can be used in medical research where tissues have been damaged or killed because many identical cells can be produced. Also, they can produce a variety of different tissues. As you may or may not know, stem cells can be controversial. We will discuss this in a minute. Stem cells are suitable for therapeutic uses, and researchers and doctors hope stem cells can help to increase understanding of how diseases and conditions develop and how they affect cells of the human body. In therapy, healthy cells are generated to replace diseased cells. You can see everything required by the process here. Additionally, stem cells are used to test drugs for safety and quality. For instance, nerve cells could be generated to test a new drug for a nerve disease. These tests would be an indicator of how successful or not the drug was and if any harm was done. One example of a disease that has been treated using stem cells is Stargardt disease. This disease is a recessively inherited disease caused by a genetic mutation. The disease causes progressive vision loss that's a result of photoreceptors dying in the center of the retina, which is called the macula. And in the macula, the fovea is a part of this. While peripheral vision remains intact, the central vision deteriorates. To treat this disease, stem cells are differentiated to become retinal pigment epithelium cells, which is a cell layer lining the back of the eye. These nourish and support other cells. In human trials, the implanted cells have restored the central field of vision. Stargardt disease is an example that you need to know. You also need to know another example, and you can see a couple of them here. One that I'm going to highlight is the leukemia. Additionally, leukemia is another disease that's been treated using stem cells. Leukemia is a blood cancer where white blood cells or leukocytes begin to grow and function abnormally, becoming cancerous. These cells are no longer able to fight off infection and they interfere with other organs. In treatment, typically the bad leukocytes are killed in chemotherapy and the patient receives a bone marrow transplant. This bone marrow contains multipotent stem cells that hopefully will form healthy blood cells to replace the abnormal cells. The use of stem cells in treatments is a fascinating and burgeoning field, so if you're curious, you can also look up more examples. And as I said, there's a few here for you as well. One of the applications you need to be able to understand and discuss revolves around the debate on the ethics of stem cells. So first, let's clear up where we typically gather stem cells from. This is really important. Because as you know, not all stem cells are the same, nor do they come from the same place. So this can change the ethical debate for and against their use. We get stem cells mainly from three places. First, we get them from embryos. Typically, embryos left over from in vitro fertilization, eggs, are the largest source. Additionally, depending on the country, certain research is also taking place and stem cell lines are continued and maintained. The second place we get stem cells is via the umbilical cord blood or the placenta of a newborn baby. The third place is in adult tissues like bone marrow. The ethical considerations associated depends on the source. Using multipotent adult tissue may be effective for certain conditions, but it's limited in its scope of application. Stem cells derived from umbilical cord blood need to be stored and preserved at a cost, raising issues of availability and access. The greatest yield of pluripotent stem cells comes from embryos, but requires the destruction of a potential living organism. Scientists can also potentially artificially generate stem cells via nuclear transfer or nuclear reprogramming with distinct benefits and disadvantages which you can see in the chart. The last slide here is a set of arguments both for and against the various types of stem cells and their use. Like all debates, it's important for you to take your own personal considerations, morals, and values into consideration. However, regardless of your position, it is also very important to understand all of the perspectives. So have a look at this slide and I encourage you to learn more. As this technology continues to improve and more uses are found, you may find yourself having to make a decision one day to save your own child's umbilical cord blood or undergo stem cell treatments. That's all I got. So as we begin to talk about cell biology, 
make sure to use this video as a reference and be sure to take lots of selfies to show that you are studying. Get it? Selfie? As always, it's really important to give credit where it's due. While the presentation, script, and video are solely of my own creation, many of the images and information contained in the presentation are not. So shout outs to the following. Most of the images and video clips come from Ivy Bio Ninja and some of the information used. Other images and info come from Biology for Life, Bionology, iBiology, and others. Lastly, some information was gleaned from the Cambridge edition of the Ivy Biology text. As the intended purpose of this presentation is to provide you with yet another resource tool to enhance your learning for the IB Biology curriculum, and this presentation should be used under and with a Creative Commons attribution license. So peace out.